Good evening. Um, welcome here to tonight's 5 by 15. And it's great to have so many of you joining us for what's going to be a wonderful session. We have five absolutely fabulous speakers lined up for you. And in true 5 by 15 tradition, they are all completely different and all totally wonderful. So tonight you're going to hear stories about identity, stories about our lives, stories about courage in the form of Miss Dior. You're going to hear about mudlarking and the kinds of things you can find on the bank of a river. And you're also going to be hearing about some spooky Halloween tales from the master storyteller, John Lanchester, who is no stranger to 5 by 15, as indeed is our first speaker, Safraz Manzor. Before I introduce Saf, I'd just like to say that all these books will be available at our bookstore and the details will be on the chat and that this session will be available on YouTube later tomorrow. So please sit back, get yourself a drink and be prepared to be entertained. I've been looking forward to this event for weeks now. So our first guest, as I said, is Safraz Manzor. Safraz is an extraordinary journalist. He's a documentary maker, he's a broadcaster, he's a screenwriter, and he's of Pakistani origin, something he's always talked about in his books and in his writing. But right now, he's come full circle back to talking about what it means to be a Muslim in Britain today in his new book called They, which is a tremendous expose of his life and all the things it means. That doesn't take me to tell you that this is an extraordinarily topical moment, given what's happened in the last few days. And I know that Saf is not going to duck from that particular issue and indeed will probably head us right into the death of Sir David Amos. Um, Safraz, welcome here to 5 by 15. Thanks so much for being with us and thank you so much for kicking off this eclectic and extraordinary evening ahead. So over to you. Thank you. Um... Uh, thanks, Rosie, and uh, hi, good evening to everybody who's uh, who's watching. So I want to take you back to the summer of 2017. It's, uh, it's June the 18th, which is a Sunday, and uh, I spent the day at a street party near where I live in North London. The road was closed so that the local kids could be playing there whilst the grown-ups had food that was shared amongst the neighbours. And the whole idea behind the street party was to meet people that you didn't already know and the sun was shining, the children were playing, the adults were chatting, and everything seemed well in the world. It was only later that night, after I'd put Layla and Ezra to bed, that I first heard the whirring of helicopters above my home. And by the time I woke up, Finsbury Park, which is 10 minutes from where I live, had turned from a neighborhood to a hashtag, because a guy, later named as Darren Osborne, had attacked the mosque. He'd driven a van into worshippers leaving Ramadan prayers, and he'd have apparently been overheard saying that he wanted to kill all Muslims. Now, I am a Muslim. I'm a British Pakistani Muslim. So the fact that this attack happened so close to where I live was bound to leave me shaken. But it actually did a lot more than that. Because the Finsbury Park attack took place in June 2017, and the previous 12 months had been incredibly depressing for anyone who wanted to believe that Britain was a decent and tolerant nation where Muslims and non-Muslims could live together. Remember what happened the previous 12 months. You'd had terror attacks in Manchester and London from Muslim extremists. You'd had the Labour MP Joe Cox, who had been vocal in speaking out on behalf of refugees who'd been murdered by a far-right extremist. And then you'd had all the revelations about Pakistani child sex grooming gangs in places like Rotherham and Rochdale. And these stories were being exploited by groups like the EDL who started suggesting that child sex exploitation was somehow a Muslim issue. Oh, and Britain had also voted for Brexit. And yes, that was meant to be about Europe, but I couldn't forget the guy I saw on Channel 4 News a couple of days after the vote, and he was in Barnsley. And I remember him telling the reporter, it's all about immigration. It's not about trade or Europe. It's all about immigration. It's to stop the Muslims from coming into this country. Simple as that. Now, I am by nature an optimist. I generally believe that people in real life are not as awful as they are on social media. 
And I like to believe that Britain is fundamentally a tolerant nation. But what if I'm wrong? What if the tensions between Muslims and non-Muslims continue to worsen? Where would that leave me? And where would that leave my kids who were growing up with a British Pakistani dad and a white Scottish Christian mother? I started to worry that Leila and Ezra would grow up feeling more comfortable with their mum's heritage than their dad's. And it was that fear that directly inspired me to want to write this book because I wanted to start to confront every common stereotype about Muslims. So I've got a question for everybody watching. What do you think when you hear the word British Muslim? Do you think back to 7-7 and Manchester Arena and London Bridge and think terrorism? Or do you think about Rochdale and Rotherham and Telford and think child sex gangs? Do you start thinking about women in niqabs who you imagine are subjugated? Do you worry that British Muslims hold opinions that are out of step with the mainstream? Or do you worry that they don't accept British values? And do you worry and wonder why they want to live in segregated communities? If any of this is close to describing you or anybody you know, that's what I was thinking of when I started to work on this book. Now, when I was growing up in a working class Pakistani family in Luton during the 80s, I had parents who told me that they were different to us. They had different values. They had a different culture. They were a threat to our way of life and they would never accept us. And they were white people. But in recent years, I've heard the same accusations repeated. They are different. They have a different culture. They are a threat to our way of life and they will never accept us. But nowadays it's far right groups as well as hate preachers in the national press and on social media who are making that accusation. And this time, they are Muslims. And that's why I call the book They. And in each chapter, I focus on a different accusation that's leveled at Muslims. They don't want to live among us. They only want to marry their own. They don't treat men and women as equals. They follow a violent religion. They hate Jews. They believe homosexuality is a sin. They don't love our country. You get the picture. And in each chapter, I ask, why do people think this? Is any of this true? And then I look for stories that both confirm and challenge that perception. Now, I started working on this book not long after having written the screenplay for Blinded by the Light, which was the film adaptation of my book, Greetings from Berry Park. And the story of Blinded by the Light is set in 1987 in Luton, and it's about a working class Pakistani kid, basically me, whose life is transformed by the music of Bruce Springsteen. And one of the fascinating things about the response that I've had to that film ever since it came out is there is hardly a week that goes by that somebody doesn't contact me on social media to say it's really connected with them. But these people aren't Muslim. They're not from Luton. Some of them, most of them, weren't even born in 1987. But they're connecting because there is something about the emotional connection to the story that they find really powerful. And I really found that that was really interesting because it reminded me of the power of storytelling to build a bridge of empathy. So rather than writing a book that was a manifesto or a book that tells you what to think, I wanted to write a book which was going to be a mix of history, reportage and memoir, and it would tell a story. It would be a mix of my story and then the bigger story. And the bigger story would start in the 1960s with a group of men who come over from the subcontinent and I tell their story in the opening chapter and then in later chapters these men get married and then they have children and the reason I chose the particular families that I did is that during the story of their own experiences they would run into some of the issues that I'm talking about in the book so for example one of the men who comes over in 1962 has a son who ends up becoming gay I have another story about a, a man who has a daughter who falls in love with a Jewish man and another man ends up raising a son who ends up prosecuting the Pakistani child sex gang members. And what was so fascinating researching and talking to these people is that they tell you little stories which I don't think any fiction writer could come up with. I'll give you an example. I was talking to a woman who when she was 16 she was married and she came over to Britain and she's living in a house with seven other guys and all the guys go off to work and she's on her own and she's just watching TV all day all on her own. And she told me that whenever she got changed, she turned the TV off because she thought in her world, she believed that the TV and the people on the TV could see her. 
The other thing I discovered about writing the book was so much of the story that I had been told, and I suspect you had been told about British Muslims, wasn't the whole story and was actually often totally wrong. So, for example, I grew up being told that, but I grew up being told by my parents that the worst thing I could do was have a relationship with somebody who wasn't a Muslim because this was this never done. But actually, the history of mixed marriages goes as far back as the late 18th century in Britain. And there were stories of Indian men who had relationships with white women who would then be given nicknames like Lascar Sally and Calcutta Louise. I'd also been told that Islam was totally opposed to homosexuality. It's always been told that, that the two things just don't go together. But actually, if you look at the history, Muslim poets and painters and scholars have frequently referred to homosexual love without any negative judgment. And during the course of working on the book, I came across a 19th century Ottoman book which featured a painting depicting a youth being penetrated by an older man while two other men stood watching. And what was fascinating to learn was that those men wouldn't have actually considered themselves gay because the concept of being homosexual only appeared in Europe in the second half of the 19th century. I interviewed more than 100 people from the, for the book, from teenage Pakistani lesbians to a 96-year-old man who's one of the last living British Muslim World War II veterans. He served in Italy under Field Marshal Montgomery, and talking to him was so inspiring because it reminded me of the long history of Muslim service to this country, which is over, often overlooked. I had no idea, for example, that among the soldiers who fought at Dunkirk were 300 Muslims from present-day Pakistan who had travelled 7,000 miles to help the British army. And I think if more people, Muslims and non-Muslims, knew these stories, I think it would be easier to challenge the narrative of inevitable conflict. Now, there's a great quote from the American children's TV presenter, Fred Rogers, who I cite at the start of my book. And he said, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. I found that quote incredibly reassuring. And that's what I've tried to do in the book is to amplify the story of the helpers. Because the truth is there is a lot of good out there if you seek it. For every bleak newspaper headline, there are loads of other stories of ordinary people doing good. Like the Muslim man I met in Bradford who persuaded his local mosque to donate money to help restore the, the, the city's synagogue. Or Naveed Yassid who'd grown up in Yorkshire but ended up working as a surgeon in Manchester. And in May 2017, he got a phone call saying he needed to come to work because there'd been an incident at the Manchester Arena. So when the victims of that bombing came to hospital, it was Naveed who was the first to attend to them. And it struck me that everyone knows that a Muslim detonated the bomb at the Arena at the Ariana, at the Ariana Grande concert, but hardly anybody knows that it was also a Muslim who tended to the injured. So what do these individual stories add up to? For me, the first thing they tell us is the danger of conflating religion with culture. Islam, the religion, has been interpreted and practiced in wildly different ways across the world and across history. So many of the issues that I looked at in the book had much less to do with religion and more to do with class and geography and where the immigrants came from. And the reason why British Muslims seem so reluctant to mix, to take on the values of the mainstream, it eventually comes down to fear. The story of fear that their culture, traditions and heritage will be diluted. And the only way to counter that fear for me is interaction across the communities. We all need to leave our silos of certainty and get to know people who are different so that we can learn the ways in which we're the same. I wanted to write a book that was hopeful but the truth is sometimes it's not easy to be hopeful. And in the aftermath of the murder of David Amos, it's easy to again feel hopeless. But the truth is working on this book has left me feeling more hopeful than I started because I've come to realize that progress is not just about politics and policies, but also people. It's fascinating to note how often in my book change comes about due to individual actions, 
the Muslim woman who defends a Jewish father on the London Underground, the Muslim man who helps his local Jewish community, the Muslim mother who accepts her son being gay, or the former EDL member who now works to tackle extremism after befriending a Muslim in his local mosque. These are all individual actions that prove to have far-reaching consequences. So ultimately, what did I learn from writing this book? I learned that hope lives and dies in the actions of individuals and the changes they make. And what that means is that all of us, me and you, have the chance to make a difference and to be a helper. Thank you. Thank you so much, Safras. That was wonderful. I really like the way you ended, that we all, we all have the chance to make individual differences. And I think that's so true and it gets so forgotten in the way that our politics work, where we all seem to seem like a herd. Um, good luck with the book and thank you very, very much for coming here and sharing it with us today. So our next speaker um, could not really be on a more different subject, but um, Laura Maitlam is a mudlarker and she spends her life fossicking, if that is the right word, around on the banks of rivers like the Thames and finding things that literally the tide and the river have brought in. She's going to tell us now about some of those things and their stories and their origins. She's the author of a couple of books, Mudlarking, Lost and Found on the River Thames was her first book. And that was a huge bestseller, a Sunday Times bestseller. And now she has gone on to write A Field Guide to Larking, which is something that all of us could uh, acquire and go out. This is a fantastic pastime because it is available to everyone. It's completely free. All you have to do is check the Tide Times, as far as I know, for the Thames. So, Laura, thank you so much for being with us and over to you. Thank you very much, Rosie. Um, yes, a completely different topic now. Um, I'm Laura and I'm a mudlark, which sounds a little bit like a confession. And um, indeed it is, it's, a, it's an obsession for me and uh, I'm going to do a little bit just to explain what it's about and, and why I love it so much, why, why I spend all my time down on the River Thames. So mudlarking is basically searching the bed of the River Thames for lost and forgotten objects and the River Thames in London really is the best place in the world to do it. I always say that um, if the Seine in Paris was tidal or you could get down into it you would find loads of stuff but you can't um, because the thing that makes the Thames so special is its tides. Twice a day the water drops, it takes six hours to come up and six and a half hours to flow out and it falls low enough for you to get down onto the bed of the actual river to look around for the objects that have been lost, the uh, casual losses, the offerings um, and rubbish that have been thrown in over 2000 years of intense human habitation. I mean, London's really only there because um, of the Thames, the Romans uh, founded their, their um, trading port there. Um, it became a, a port for the world, the, the center of an empire. It's been a busy highway. People have lived along it. And all of this has contributed to the amount of stuff that has just gone into the river. Um, now, of course, the river Thames or the tidal Thames isn't just that little East Enders wiggle through central London that we all think about. Um, it's actually 160 kilometers long. It starts at Teddington up in West London and it ends out on the estuary. And it's a very different beast wherever you go down onto the river. And I mudlark right from, the, from, the, from Teddington right out to the estuary. In Teddington, it's green and bucolic, it's beautiful. It's, it's slow enough and gentle enough to be able to go um, pond dipping with a net if you've got kids. Uh, out on the estuary, there is just miles and miles and miles of thick, deep mud. It's real Dickens land, Dickens country, where, um, where Magwitch crawled through the, the mud away from his prison ship. Um, and each stretch has its own character and variety. Uh, you know, depending where you're searching, you're gonna find different things. At Rotherhithe, you're gonna find uh, objects that have been part of boat building, uh, where it was where the boats were built and where they were torn apart. And this has all fallen into the mud. In central London, that's where you get the most variety of things because that's where people have lived and worked and, and traveled for 2000 years. And really every tide is different. It delivers something new. So the river really is just this great, big, lucky dip. And um, 
the, the next slide's already gone up. That's me in my element. That's me being a mudlark. And in my hand is a 2000, well, it's an over 2000 year, years old. It's an Iron Age pot, a complete Iron Age pot I found sitting on top of the mud out in the estuary. You can see I had to crawl through quite a lot of mud to find it. Um, perfectly preserved by the mud because it was cocooned beautifully in the mud. And the mud is also preserves things perfectly because it's anaerobic. There's no oxygen gets into the Thames mud. So it preserves things like leather and even fabric and wood and, uh, and, um, and all those sort of organic objects that would just rot away in soil, in fields. Um, and it's perfectly preserved. So you can find the most incredible things. Um, now I am really just the most recent in, a, in an incarnation in a long line of scavengers that um, have worked the River Thames and picked things up. Um, the, Henry Mayhew, uh, he was a uh, Victorian social commentator in the mid 1800s. He really wrote very beautifully and evocatively about the mudlarks, describing the old women and children, the most society's most poor and vulnerable, who went down armies of them that went down onto the Thames foreshore to wade around in the mud, which was really just raw sewage back then because the, the river was just a giant cesspit with the, all of the city's muck going into it, dead animals, goodness knows what. And they would wade around without any shoes on, looking for anything they could use or sell. They were looking for bones and rags and coal, copper nails if they were lucky and bits of rope, anything they could sell to keep themselves out of the workhouse because actually the workhouse was such a shameful and horrific place to go. Mudlarking was a better option, but it's not just a Victorian phenomena. I think there's probably always been river scavengers on the Thames for as long as there's people and been people poor enough and desperate enough to do it and objects to find. I think people have always been down there looking for things. But the very first written record of mudlarks was by a man called Patrick Calhoun. Now he founded a police force on the Thames to protect the West India merchant ships that lay in anchor just off the, rib, off the um, edge of the river, waiting to unload their valuable cargoes of rum and sugar and spices. And in his 1796 book, A Treatise on the Police of the Metropolis, he described gangs, colorfully named gangs of criminals that preyed on the West India ships. There were lightermen, scuffle hunters, heavy horsemen, river pirates, and at the bottom of this list of miscreants are the mudlarks. Now the mudlarks, they hung around, they lurked around in the mud, around the ship's hulls, waiting for packages of spice and sugar and bladders of rum to be thrown off the ships by all these other criminals that broke, on, broke into the ships. And they'd convey them off to the, uh, to the taverns of Rotherhithe and, and Wapping and on into the black market. So mudlarks really have always been the lowest of the low. Uh, but I, I'm not a thief, I, I don't mudlark for survival. Um, I do it to satisfy my obsession with the past. Uh, for me, it's, it's, it's a really unique link with the people of the past, the ordinary people, not the people who made it into history books or got roads named after them or great big statues. These are just the ordinary people, our ancestors, people like you and me who, who really didn't leave any sort of real impact on history but they're the people who made London and maybe all they've left behind to say that they were ever there is a, is a broken cup or, a, or a, a, a discarded clothes hook that fell off one day when they were pulling their cloak around them on a cold windy day on the river. And it's this incredible link with the past, this intimate link with London's past that really makes me feel almost like a time traveler sometimes when I'm down on the river, bending down and picking something up that I know nobody's touched since the last person that dropped it or threw it away, maybe even 2000 years ago, um, is just the most incredible, incredible feeling. And that's when I get my hit. Um, it's not the collecting the objects because you never really own these objects. You're just a, you're just a custodian. You're the next custodian in, the, in this long line of people. Um, and it gives me a great sense of, uh, connect, of comfort, this, this connection to the past. Um, and it's something I've been doing for 20 years. It's been my escape from the city. I grew up uh, on a farm. I was quite a solitary child um, and I moved to the city. I was looking for that sort of solitude and that empty space in the city. And I tried the parks. Uh, they didn't really do it for me. And then one day I was down on the river and I found the river. And I think a lot of people in London really don't 
see the river, they stop seeing it, it's something that just is there, it just exists, it's something annoying to get across, um, and you, you just don't really notice it, but it's actually the most wonderful place to get away from the city, uh, to get back in touch with nature, it's a streak of nature, you can feel the weather on your face, there's no, there's no uh, um, buildings to stop the rain and the wind, and it's so peaceful, um, and actually mudlarking itself, the act of doing something and nothing is a great meditation, it's being beside moving water that takes your troubles away, doing something that occupies you, that doesn't tax your mind, that you can just let your mind go and forget your troubles is the most incredible thing. Um, if we could just see the next, next slide, please. Um, so, they, they, so what can you find? You never know what you're going to find next. That's the, that's the, that's the obsessional thing that keeps me coming back. Um, I don't dig. I don't use a metal detector. Um, I have a great respect for the foreshore, for its fragility. And I only collect what the river chooses to deliver on a tide and leave on the surface. So in, in essence, it's, it's what's there on one tide and gone on the next. Um, and of course, I should say you need, do need a permit from the Port of London Authority to go mudlarking. I've got one of those. They're really easy to apply for. You just go online, go to the Port of London Authority website, and you can apply for one there. Um, and I report my objects to the, port, the Portable Antiquity Scheme, which is part of the British Museum, which is also really important. Um, so mudlarking responsibly is a, is a really important part of mudlarking. Um, and uh, the objects that you'll find that are really just the ordinary things, ordinary things owned by ordinary people, the things that maybe they threw away, uh, that they dumped into the river. The river has been a great rubbish dump over the years and uh, some things got in because people dumped them. Some people, uh, they dropped things, they're casual losses. Um, other things, they were thrown in on purpose, uh, wedding rings. We still find modern wedding rings and people have been throwing away love tokens for generations. Um, offerings, religious offerings, lots of religious offerings going right back to the Bronze Age, uh, medieval times, uh, Roman times, even today, uh, Hindus these days, they still revere the river, they, they use it as a substitute for the Ganges. And here are some of the things I have found. Um, the oldest objects you can find on the river are obviously fossils, um, preserved creatures that are millions of years old. Uh, the oldest uh, human-made objects, Mesolithic flints, just below the fossil on the top left-hand corner, which is a fossilized urchin. These are uh, Mesolithic flints, so those are thousands and thousands of years old, you know, London's first Londoners. Um, in the centre, that's a Tudor shoe. Now, that uh, is an example of anaerobic preservation. I pulled that out of the river as perfect as the day it went in. And when I looked inside, I could see just the impression of its original little owner's toes and heel. And of course, all of these objects, they, they, they leave great questions. Um, you know, how did they end up there? Who owned them? Um, you know, why did they get there? Um, if we could see the next slide. And there are some more objects here. Uh, scary, creepy things, a glass eye, that gave me, really gave me the creeps looking back at me. Um, a horrible amount of dentures. If it fits down the toilet, it will end up in the river because raw sewage still, unfortunately, does go into the river. Um, a great big barnacle scraped off the bottom of a trade ship. Um, and there's even uh, a colony of seahorses. Sadly, this one was dead by the time I found it outside the, the globe, uh, on the foreshore in front of the globe. But there is a colony of seahorses um, in uh, just around the Isle of Dogs. Uh, if we can see the next slide. So I spend up to six hours at a time staring at the mud, and uh, that really is a lot of thinking time. And I think about the legacy that every generation has left. And I often think about ours, what have we left behind? Now, the poet Philip Larkin said, what will survive of us is love. But uh, sadly, I know from mudlarking that he's wrong. Floating just below the surface is lots and lots of plastic. You might not see it when you're in central London, but it's there. If you look in the rubbish catchers, they're always full. It catches on the bends, and there's actually islands of wet wipes. Wet wipes don't just vanish when you flush them. They end up in rivers, they end up in the sea and in, in the Thames, they're actually creating islands. Our rubbish is changing the geography of the river. Now, while our ancestors' rubbish was made of bone and clay and glass, leather and wood, and it will break down harmlessly and essentially return to where it came from, our plastic legacy the legacy that we're leaving in the mud is dangerous, 
and it's here forever. Thank you. Lara, that's wonderful, except that it was a terrible sort of terrible note to end on. And I have to say, I was thinking about that when you spoke about what we now throw away. And um, I was reading somewhere that we were throwing away 13 million masks per second or something across the globe. And you sort of imagine all of them tipping up in the Thames. But it says so much about um, our ancestors, how wonderfully beautifully made everything was. That little shoe is extraordinary. So thank you very, very much for sharing that with us. And please don't let the plastic put people off being a mudlark of themselves because you can do it and you can also buy Lara's fantastic book. So do do it and get going. Now, our next speaker has been to 5515 before and we're absolutely thrilled to have John Lanchester back with us. John's book, Capital, was turned into an absolutely extraordinary three-part TV documentary about what happened to a street in London. I mean, it was it was just an absolutely brilliant work, shortlisted for the Booker Prize, as was one of his later books, The Wall. But he's here tonight to talk to us about a collection of stories called Reality and Other Stories, which are spine-tingling glimpses of the future. And John is a master storyteller, as Safraz said, um, the power of storytelling builds the bridges to empathy. And I think that John absolutely exemplifies that idea. So John, welcome back to 5 by 15. We're so pleased to have you. Thank you very much, Rosie. Um, and thank you, Lara. That was really interesting. Um, my uh, wife went mudlarking um, on a, you know, with a group on a, a little expedition. And I've only done it once and found a gun. Um, and uh, the person leading the group um, uh, had to call the police because apparently you do that if you find anything like that. And uh, they were waiting for about an hour. The police came. And it turned out it was a starting pistol, um, uh, which apparently they are quite often used in robberies. So it's a weird. Um, although it wasn't actually a life gun, they use it to um, scare people into handing over their stuff. So anyway, but, um, you know, it's not just cute artifacts and ornaments that are found in the river. Um, so anyway, um, I'm here to talk about. Uh, my new collection, just out in paperback, Reality and Other Stories, um, which, uh, as Rosie said, um, is a collection of short stories. And um, it was a very um, odd thing for me to have published because the truth is, uh, I don't often read short stories. I don't particularly like, like them as a form. Um, Philip Larkin said that um, he always thought short stories should either be they were either anecdotes or novels. Um, and uh, as a reader, actually, I think I basically um, agree with that. Um, and one exception I've always found is ghost stories. Because the thing about ghost stories is that they always have, um, the thing I like about them is there's an element of connection with the audience. That a ghost story is something that you tell someone or that someone tells you, it implies this sort of element of personal presence and connection. That I've always found rather intriguing. And there's something about the mixture of, you know, a ghost story, you know it's going to be a pretty story, you know where it's going at the same time it has this obligation, despite the fact that, you know, that it has this obligation to surprise and twist. Um, and that, that's an unusual combination of familiar and unfamiliar, comforting and strange. And um, I started writing them um, really through that element of connection, but there are old family friends who we often see at New Year, we can stay with at New Year. And the first time I, I went there, I remember thinking, noticing there was a sort of odd thing about house parties. When you meet, meet a group, some of them you know, some of them you don't. And in the early stages of that, there's always, there's almost always people you haven't quite met. But it happens at a normal party. You know, you're in a room full of mixture of people you know and strangers. And I had this odd thought that, you know, you could go through a whole weekend or a long weekend with people and actually not have met everyone you were with. And that was the seed, really, um, for the, the first story in the book. Because a few years later, we were back staying with the same friends, staying at New Year. And I wanted to do something to thank them for their hospitality, because they're very generous. And I thought that one of the things I could do, since what I do for a living is tell stories, I thought I could tell a story. And I thought, you know, the appropriate kind of story on a you know, cold New Year's Day, everybody hung over and tired, and the fire flickering in the fireplace, we could tell a ghost story. And as soon as I had that thought, I had this thing pop into my head of, um, 
a memory of that idea I'd had about, from a few years before about mingling with people and not being quite sure who was who. And it turned out that while in the intervening years, my subconscious, I suppose, my unconscious had cooked up this idea, because it popped into my head very fully formed that what if one of the people, you go somewhere for the, a weekend to stay with people, and one of the people isn't actually a person. One of the people who seems real isn't actually real. And that was the premise of the first story in the collection, it's called Signal. And I wrote it, as I said, I wrote it to, for, the, for the room, to read to the room, to people. Um, I, I wasn't intending to publish it, it was meant to, it was kind of a perform thing. Um, but after I read it, someone said, you know, someone suggested I send it out for, um, to be published, which I did. And I thought, you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained, sent it to the New Yorker. Who, who, who accepted it. And it was such a rush of, uh, it was such a, I mean, I was in my mid fifties at that point. You don't often get things in your mid fifties that hit you with this thrilling sense of newness and encouragement. And, uh, and you know, it was an absolutely wonderful thing to happen. And, I, and it doesn't happen very often that, you know, the first short story I ever wrote published in New York. I don't like to boast, but it was a great buzz when it happened. And I thought, well, okay. Um, so it turns out I can write short stories and, um, you know, having tried it once, I'd be willing to try it again, at which point nothing happened. Um, and I realized that I think about short stories, I found, I don't know if it's true for all writers, but it's true for me, is that it's rather unlike fiction. Fiction novels are something you, I, I find you have to sort of plan and structure. There's so many uh, almost architectural components in a novel, you, you know, it's like, um, like I also think of it as like trying to build a bridge or an arch, you have to have the beginning and the end, even if you have nothing else to sort of start creating the structure. Um, I, you know, I find I have to plan, I have to know things about where it's going. And it's an active process. It's a process of actively, consciously making things, making choices. And short stories I found aren't like that. And the thing they are like is um, when I was a, a teenager, uh, I used to write bad poetry. Um, and the thing about those poems was that they kind of came slightly unbidden. They weren't something I actively went after, they were something that came to me. And I found short stories were like that. So it was something that, even though I decided I wanted to have a go at writing some more, but I actually had to wait for the idea to come. And then the second one that came, we were on holiday, we were family holiday in Lyon. And we had a longish drive coming up and we had our children with us and I realized that we didn't have an audio book. So I slightly frantically was looking at the Audible app on my phone, thinking about what we might order. Um, and Oh, um, you know, thing that goes over really well with the kids at that point was, was Martin Jarvis's. And he was an amazing reader of audiobooks, and he was one of the really good things you would have. So went to the website, started downloading it, and I suddenly thought, actually, this is this this is some, this is a very very uncanny, strange thing. Because I was standing there, there's lots of Roman ruins in Lyon. You know, we're on a Roman site, slightly on the old town, slightly above the town. And I was suddenly hit by the sense of the uncanniness of it that you know over the airway in a completely magical way is getting the voice of an actor to read and to reanimate the words of a dead writer and something about the juxtaposition the roman site the kind of new technology the thing about a voice kind of bringing a, a thing to life gave me the idea for um, a story about a, a haunt, an audio book that's haunted. It came from that sense of the magic and strangeness around the ability to have the voice come through the ether. Um, and that's the second story in the collection. Um, and uh, it's called Coffin Liquor. Um, and it, which by the way, I had an odd thing about the work. And I had various people who said nice things about it when it came out, but they made have the same complaint. There's one thing in the book where the character who's a very dried up, desiccated, um, rather kind of purse lit 
censorious, unlikable academic. And at one point they go around an art gallery and he comes out afterwards and he, he's asked what he thought. He says, you know, paintings are technically very good, but you know, it's a pity they're about you know religion and myth and stories. They should be about something interesting like you know, um, cell division, DNA and meiosis. And there's a bunch of a number of people said, a number of my friends said, you know, I really liked it. I just thought that line, you know, nobody, nobody's that far gone. Uh, which was the only thing in the story which is drawn directly from life. Incidentally, that's the thing that often happens to the writer. Things that you take directly from life just don't work in books because they're completely unbelievable. So that was a lesson we learned. Um, and then the point at which I realized I'd gone past the point of no return, and I was actually writing a, a collection of stories, um, not just having these sort of bits, bolts of lightning hit me every now and then. Um, was not long after that, for reasons I now can't explain, I was watching, I started watching a season of Love Island, I think it was in about 2017, maybe 2016, um, and was very struck by it as a vision of absolute horror, that there are these people who are trapped together, and Partly the horror that John Paul Sartre talks about is that hell is other people, it's all about confinement. But there was also a kind of horror in um, ghost, ghost stories are often set in dark and cold and with flickering lights. And that, that thing I talked about earlier about you know, winter and the uncanny and you know, the wind whistling at the window, there's that kind of intimacy and darkness and winterness around them. But there's actually also something very scary I thought about, about sunlight, about really baking sunlight. So you know how that thing is like you're on, if you're on holiday and you're sort of crossing a square, a piazza or something, and the sun is blazing bright and this white stone all around you. And this was nowhere to hide. You can have this extraordinarily strong sense of being trapped, that you can't get away from this light. And that was the idea that turned into the third story in the collection about, real, about reality TV contestants who are trapped in a world which may or may not be real in a way that they don't quite realise. And, and the kind of idea for me, the idea the kind of hook that got me going was the idea of setting a ghost story in the place of blazing sunlight, no shadow. That's actually the problem, that's the confining thing. There's no shadow, there's no dark, there's no grey, there's no inflection or hiding which is absolutely blazing light and I wrote it and I was torn between titles and calling it Love Island because that's what the inspiration is in it, reality which is a more general title and it was the London Review book published it and they liked the title Love, I Love Island so we went with that and then what happened is that over the next two years three contestants and presenters things who linked to the show took their, took their own lives and that left me, I mean, recoiling in horror and also, frankly, unable to watch reality TV. I haven't been able to watch any form of reality TV since. And one of the things that I've come to think about stories about the uncanny, ghost stories, I mean, they're more stories of the uncanny than they are strictly ghost stories in the book, there's this mixture, is that we've, we live, we've got so used to these devices which are in effect a form of wizardry. They're like something out of Harry Potter. Um, you know, in Star Trek, the idea of a communicator that talks instantly across time and space to you, wherever you are, is, um, you know, something from like the 30th century, way in the future. And Arthur C. Clarke, great science fiction writer, once said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I think that in a way is what we've all got used to. We've got used to with our phones, with the ability to access any information and talk to anyone, anywhere in the world, permanently, wherever we are. I think in a way we accidentally cross into a world which is full of magic. Our brains aren't prepared for it. We're more and more vulnerable than ever to all sorts of falsehoods and untruths. And our instincts towards skepticism and credulity have been jumped over by these devices. And I've come to think that if you're writing about the modern world, in a way you, you have to write in a way that lets in magic, lets in the uncanny, because that's the only way you can tell the truth about the way we live now, is by accepting that 
in a we sort of crossed over um, into a world where magic surrounds us. Thank you very much. John, thank you. Thank you so much. I really love that idea that we live with this strange magic thing. I think everything went pear-shaped when you realized you had no clue how most of the things in your house and around you worked and that you therefore had you were therefore massively dependent. But of course the mobile has taken us so much further so thank you and um please get the book it's uh, it sounds absolutely wonderful um i don't know about all of you but i am absolutely a fan of oliver berkman's and his column this column will change your life which appears in the guardian every saturday and i have devoured many of them but i have not obviously devoured four thousand of them four thousand weeks this is the number of weeks oliver says that we are all going to be alive and basically it's, I think, uh, a general prompt to say, well, what are you going to do with them? How do, how do you make the best of them? What's the, you know, this is a finite span, something we probably don't think of enough. So he has now written a book called 4,000 Weeks, which is based on all the things he has written about, and which is a, essentially, I don't know if the right word is guide, but it is a way to tell us how to get the most out of our lives. So Oliver, we're so thrilled to have you with us. And I know you're now back in the UK from having been living in the States. So welcome from Yorkshire and over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm so grateful for this opportunity to talk about a topic that I'm completely obsessed with. So, so back in 1908, the, the novelist and journalist Arnold Bennett wrote a short book that some of you um, might have read. It's called How to Live on 24 Hours a Day. And he writes near the beginning of the book that he'd recently seen a newspaper article discussing, quote, the question of whether a woman can exist nicely in the country on 85 pounds a year. And he goes on, I've also seen an essay, How to Live on Eight Shillings a Week, but I have never seen an essay, How to Live on 24 Hours a Day. And it's a funny observation, of course, because on the one hand, we all already live on 24 hours a day, whether we like it or not. So it doesn't seem like we would need any advice on how to do that. But on the other hand, at least if you're anything like me, my goodness, do we need advice, right? Because one way or another, it either feels like 24 hours isn't nearly enough, or alternatively that it ought to be enough, but that for some reason you're not using them in the way that you know would actually be most meaningful. Bennett said that he was writing for, quote, my companions in distress, that innumerable band of souls who are haunted more or less painfully by the feeling that the years slip by and slip by and slip by and that they have not yet been able to get their lives into proper working order. I find that so relatable, this sense of like not quite being on top of things, not quite having things sorted out so that real life somehow hasn't quite really begun yet, which obviously gets more absurd as a thought the older that you get. And it's really fascinating to me that this thought seems to have preoccupied the Edwardians like it preoccupies us now. But while Bennett expresses this problem so well and this feeling so well, I can't agree with him on his solution because he basically just seems to think that if you, all you need to do is like when you get home from work at about half past five in the afternoon, all you need to do is just sort of buck your ideas up fight the feelings of tiredness that you're experiencing and make time then for some edifying activity for you know stamp collecting or reading ancient roman history or, or learning about botany or something alternatively he suggests you could get up earlier in the mornings instead and the book even contains instructions on how to make a cup of tea in case you're up before the servants Obviously, there are a few things that are wrong with this picture that bear the mark of the time he was writing. Most obviously, the idea that you might have servants to make your tea. And more generally, it's pretty obvious throughout that he's only really talking to middle class, upper middle class men. But there's a deeper and more timeless problem here, I think, too, which is kind of one way into what I'm trying to explore in my book, 4,000 Weeks. He implies basically that if you can find better or more efficient ways to use your time, if you can fit more in to the time you have, then there'll finally be time to do everything that matters and you'll feel at last as though you have your life in, as he puts it, proper full working order. And what I want to say is that you won't, that there will always be more that feels like it matters than you'll have time to do. And that it will always in some sense feel like there are ways you should be using your time that you're not using it for. 
but I also want to try to persuade people that this seemingly incredibly depressing message, when you let it sink in, when you let it permeate you a bit, is actually incredibly liberating and is the key to a different, more relaxing, but also more empowered uh, relationship with time. See, look, if you live to be about 80, as you heard before, you'll have had a little over 4,000 weeks of life. So it's not very long at all, even if you get that much. And yet here we are as humans in this unique situation where we can sort of conceive of infinity, of we can formulate limitless ambitions for our lives or feel the pull of limitless obligations that we need, we think we need to fulfill. But at the same time, we have, you know, we're material creatures. We have this staggeringly limited time, limited attentional bandwidth, limited stamina, limited financial resources, all the rest of it. So really there's just an innate mismatch here, right? It's like a maths problem. You can ascribe the feeling of importance of something really mattering to far more things than you're ever gonna have the opportunity to do with your life. And that of course is before you look at our situation today where you know, thanks to technology, automation, the intensification of economic competition, the gig economy, we're in this world of, eff of effectively sort of infinite inputs. So there's no limit really to the number of emails that you can receive or the number of demands the boss can make or for that matter, the number of exotic locales you might wanna visit. Um, and so if you respond to all that by doing what comes naturally, by trying to find ways to fit more in, or even if you take it to an extreme like I did in my years as uh, what I call, a, other people call a productivity geek, you know, trying to reshape your life and your to-do lists and your organizational system so that you'll finally find time for everything that matters. None of that's gonna work. It's gonna be like getting faster at climbing up an infinitely tall ladder, right? You'll get busier and you'll feel more stressed but you'll never get to the top. In fact, it's actually worse than that. You'll actually create more work for yourself to do. So for example, like the better you get at answering emails, and I learned this from bitter personal experience, the more emails you end up receiving because you reply to things and they generate further replies and you get a reputation for being responsive to email. So more people email you. Whereas, you know, if you neglect your email, it's actually surprising how often people find alternative solutions to the problems that they were emailing you about in the first place. And I think what applies to email applies to the whole of life, right? You won't get on top of everything that feels like it matters just by working harder, by doing more, because that would entail escaping our human finitude. And that's, that's something we can't do for obvious reasons. I write in the book about an experience I had sitting on a park bench on a winter morning in Brooklyn, uh, where I lived at the time trying to figure out some ingenious schedule for the day that would enable me to get through what felt like an even more anxiety inducing number of tasks than usual and just suddenly realizing that none of this was ever going to work that I was never going to be able to marshal enough self-discipline and find exactly the right techniques to power myself through to this feeling of, of mastery of control over time and moreover, it became clear to me eventually that I'd been pursuing this fantasy, which I think is very widespread, as a kind of emotional avoidance, a, a way of trying to escape the reality of what it meant to be uh, a finite human, to find a place of control from which, in my case, I could face certain decisions about time, you know, big decisions about relationships and work and parenthood, in a state of fearlessness and certainty, rather than seeing that fear and uncertainty were just part of the package than what an inescapable. And I think ultimately most of our method, attempts to master our time like this, to feel like we have our lives in full working order, as Arnold Bennett put it, our efforts to not feel what it's like to feel, to be human, to try to feel limitless and infinite instead. And it doesn't work. It just makes us feel more stressed and it makes life less meaningful. As various Buddhist scholars have observed, I think the problem here comes not from the fact that we are finite humans, but from imagining that there might be a way out of the situation of being a finite human. So um, the American Zen Buddhist teacher, uh, Charlotte Jocko Beck, in a quote I use at the start of the book says, she's talking about life in general here. She says, what makes it unbearable is your mistaken belief that it can be cured. And I think the reason that this is ultimately a liberation and a source of power is that once you face the reality of being finite, a little bit at least, once you give up this impossible struggle to have no limits, that's when you get to pour your time and attention and energy into, you know, finally getting around to doing a handful of things 
that count. I think it's really interesting to ponder, to reflect on how in so many cultures at so many different points in history, it would have been just completely baffling to talk and to think about time in the way that we mainly do today as something that we struggle with or have to fight against or need to use well or we're worried that we might be wasting because you know if you'd asked say a, a peasant in the early medieval English countryside maybe here in the North York Moors where I'm speaking tonight if you asked them if they felt like they had enough time left to get through a certain list of tasks I don't think that question would have made any sense because people live then uh, and at many other times in history too, in a mode that um, anthropologists call task orientation, meaning they're so closely yoked to the natural world that the rhythms of the day just emerged from the tasks themselves, not from trying to line things up against a schedule or a timetable. There was just no reason in the first place to think about time as something that you used. You just sort of milked the cows when they needed milking and uh, harvested the crops when they needed harvesting. And a productivity guru who, had arrived, who would arrive and say, you know, why don't you do all the milking for the year in the next couple of weeks to get it out of the, de out of the way, would have been run out of the village as a, as a lunatic. It made much more sense perhaps to even think about people in those days as just sort of living in time, perhaps even living as time, so just being a stretch of time with no sense of fighting against it or struggling to master it or getting out on top of it but just sort of living it moment to moment. Obviously, it would be really easy to romanticize the terrible lives of medieval peasants, which were really completely terrible in almost all ways. And I don't think we should try to return to that. Uh, and similarly, I don't mean to imply that most people are in any position to just sort of walk away from their impossible inboxes or ignore a boss who's making impossible demands of them. But what I think we can hope to do, and the reason that I tried to write this book, and I think it could benefit us all a bit more, is to, it's just to sort of drop back down into reality a bit more, to see where we really inevitably are, and see how we've been engaged in a sort of impossible struggle with time, and attempt to do more than we possibly ever could do, or to balance competing desires or competing societal demands that simply can't be balanced. Um, to try to avoid making the tough choices with finite time that are just a sort of built-in uh, inevitability of, of being a human with finite time. And especially to stop attaching our sense of self-worth, our sense of having you know, justified our existence on the planet for the day to this sort of goal that we can never actually attain. Because I think when, then when you see where you are, you realize that all you can ever do and thus all you ever really need to do um, isn't to try to get a handle on time, get on top of everything, get your life in full working order. But in the words of Carl Jung, uh, to just do the next most necessary thing and then the next and then the next and then the next uh, until the final moment, which you no longer can. And at the end of writing this book, I guess I felt surer than I ever had that this is the way, like the only way to do your best to build the most meaningful life that is on the cards for you, not to try to wrestle life into submission, but just to be here in the only moment that it ever is and to do the next most necessary thing, which in my case right now is to stop talking. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Oh, Oliver, that was just wonderful. It made me think of all my wretched to-do lists before I go to sleep. <laughs> And the sort of insanity of the to-do list and the, and the kind of also the knowledge that you're never ever going to get through it and that the whole idea of it is that it's stuff that will be punted along that was very really inspiring and I really look forward to reading your book and now our final speaker but absolutely um great save up of wonderment for the end is Justine Piccadilly who has written many books. Um, one of her bestsellers was about Coco Chanel, which was called The Legend and Her Life. But her most recent book is about another equally famous name, Miss Dior, A Story of Courage and Couture. This is a fantastically beautifully illustrated book. It reads like a thriller. It's a story that Justine has spent a long time researching, and I know she has traced her steps through the war, through 20th century France, and pulled together a quite astonishing tale of a very, very remarkable and somewhat unknown person who 
we now know a great deal more about. So Justine, welcome from Norfolk, where I know you are because I've been following your Twitter account during lockdown, which has been amazingly engaging. So thank you very much. And um, I'd like to say to everyone to make sure that they notice what Justine is wearing because it is old classic Dior. And I, I hazarded that it might be vintage, but I was knocked back on that, but it's old and it's extremely beautiful. Welcome. Hello, everybody. It's really lovely to be here. The story that I'm going to tell you tonight um, started in many years ago when I was invited to look in the Dior archives. And as Rosie said, my, my last book was a biography of Coco Chanel. And when I was invited to look in the Dior archives, I thought that perhaps my next book would be a biography of Christian Dior, the great couturier who really changed the way that women looked in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. But as I searched through the archives and talked to archivists, suddenly, several years after I began, I was struck by the story in a sense, and I'm saying this because of, of John's talk, of a ghost who had been completely forgotten. And this is Christian Dior's younger sister, Catherine Dior, who was his best friend, who was the woman he loved most in the world, and who had been a heroine of the French resistance during the Second World War and had been deported to Ravensbrück concentration camp. And what struck me was that given how famous Christian Dior was and remains, it's one of his name is still synonymous with, with luxury, with beauty, with femininity. How was it that his younger sister had been entirely forgotten? So the story really starts in a garden, which was the garden where Christian and Catherine grew up. They lived in Normandy. Christian was born in 1905. Catherine, who you see in this picture as the little girl in the front row between her parents was born in 1917. And there were five children, but what Christian and Catherine shared was a love of gardening. Their mother was a rather remote figure, but the way to her heart was through her love of gardening. Their father had inherited a very successful family business which um, was that of fertilizer. But in the terrible aftermath of first the First World War and then the glo first global flu pandemic, and then the Wall Street crash, the Dior family lost so much. One son who'd fought in the First World War developed shell shock, another developed schizophrenia, their mother died of septicemia, and their father lost everything in the aftermath of the Wall Street crash. And Christian and Catherine both had to earn a living. And Christian taught himself to draw. He became a fashion illustrator. And as soon as he was able, he asked Catherine to come and live with him in Paris, where they shared a tiny little, first of all, a room together and then an apartment. And she got a job, which he found her, working, selling accessories and hats and gloves in a Maison de Mode. And he was forging an early career as a, as a fashion illustrator and a freelance designer. And then comes the outbreak of the Second World War. And they both retreat to Provence where their father was living in a little farmhouse. And by the end of, of 1941, Christian made the difficult decision to, to return to occupied Paris, and he got a job for a couturier called Lucien Lelong. And Catherine joins the French resistance. This happens because she undertakes her first act of resistance by going in search of a radio. And by buying a radio, it was to listen to the band broadcasts of General de Gaulle. And that alone was enough to risk imprisonment. But the man that supplies her with the radio is, a, is an early member of the French resistance called Hervé de Charbonnery. And he recruits her 
for his resistance network, which was called F2, and reported into both British and Polish intelligence in London. It had been started by two Polish intelligence officers originally. And it was they were joined, um, they were helped by SOE agents who'd been parachuted into to France. And Catherine proved herself to be a very brave and resourceful member of the French resistance. First of all, operating in the south of France along the Mediterranean coast. And then at the beginning of 1944, as the Gestapo were closing in on the resistance, her resistance network in the south, she was sent to Paris, to the heart of occupied France. And she starts living again with her brother Christian, who gives his tacit support to the resistance by sheltering her and sheltering other members of her resistance network. So things become more and more dangerous with D-Day, with the Allies landing in June 1944. And as the Allies fight their way towards Paris, the resistance networks are doing more and more and more, but their lives are becoming more and more endangered. And in July, early July, 1944, Catherine, like others in her network, is betrayed by a French collaborator. And she was arrested by a unit that was known as the Rue de la Pompe Gestapo. And she was taken to Rue de la Pompe in the heart of bourgeois Paris, where she was tortured by Frenchmen, although the unit was run by Germans. And she didn't give away a single name or piece of information. And as a consequence, she saved the life of her brother, her best friend, Hervé, who was her lover, his family, and everybody else in her resistance network. But she was tortured over two days and then sent to a French prison on the outskirts of Paris and then an internment camp. And then in August, just days before the liberation of Paris, she was deported to Germany on a train with 400 other women and about 2000 men on the final train out of Paris of deportees. The men were sent to Buchenwald concentration camp and she was sent to Ravensbrück concentration camp, which was Hitler's only camp for women. In order to research the book, I had spent days, you know, hours, months actually, looking in the archives of, of the French resistance, the Dior archives, archives of British intelligence, but I then had to follow in Catherine's footsteps to Ravensbrook, and I felt really scared and, and terrified about going to such a dark place. It's a place that very, very few people visit. It's, it's not like the other camps, most famously Auschwitz, which is a place of pilgrimage for many. I went to Ravensbrook twice to go through the archives there and on each occasion I was practically the only person there. But what I found was incredibly moving and unexpected in that there were, there were symbols and mementos and talismans of resistance there and in the three subsequent camps that Catherine was moved to. She was part of what was, was called extermination through labor there, there was a gas chamber at Ravensbrook, but she and the majority of the other female prisoners were there to be worked to death. Miraculously, in Ravensbrook, I found a rose garden and roses were tremendously important to Christiane and Catherine Dior. Their, their mother had loved roses, they had learned to grow roses, their father's farm in Provence was in the midst of the rose growing area. And there at Ravensbrook, there is a rose garden that was planted after the end of the war by survivors in, in memory of, of the people that had died there, their sisters, their best friends, their mothers, their daughters. And the rose that grows at Ravensbrook that was bred by a French woman, 
to survive these very, very harsh winters is called resurrection. And Catherine, having miraculously survived, returned to Paris in May 1945, the end of May 1945. And her return is a kind of resurrection. And her brother was there to meet her at the train station and he didn't recognize her. her. Her head had been shaved. She was so emaciated. She was unrecognizable as the beautiful young woman who had had left, um, who had who'd been seized. And, and there's something about her return which represents something very powerful for Christian. Catherine recovers that summer in Provence, surrounded by the rose fields that she, she loved so well. And then she returns to Paris to live with Christiane again that autumn. And she becomes a dealer in cut flowers in the flower market in Paris. But at the same time, she also starts tending her own rose fields in Provence. And it is at this moment that Christiane takes the decision to create a perfume that he names Misty Or in tribute to Catherine. He says that he wants to create the perfume of love and Misty Or, its, its essential ingredient is roses. And these are roses that Catherine herself goes on to grow. She grows the roses that are used in Misty Or. It is also flowers that form the inspiration for Christian's first collection, which is famously called the New Look. But in fact, what he'd called it was La Carole, which takes its name from the corolla, uh, the, the flower, the inner flower and the petals around it. And Catherine, his beloved younger sister, is literally the flower woman of this, this creation. She is growing roses, she's growing jasmine, she's also dealing in cut flowers, and yet her story is forgotten. There's many complicated reasons for this. Many, in fact, the majority of the surviving women of Ravensbrook, their stories are forgotten. Those of them who wrote diaries or memoirs or books found that nobody wanted to publish them. Catherine and her comrades in the French resistance, her female comrades, discover that nobody really wants to talk to them. This is perhaps because of the widespread collaboration in France. Catherine, when she joined the resistance, was one of only 100,000 active members of the French resistance. And this is in a population of 40 million. So somehow for France to move forward, at the end of the Second World War, you see, whether it's conscious or not, a decision to forget the stories of women like Catherine. Christian becomes the most famous French man in the world. Misty Or, both the perfume and the couture dress that bears its name, which is covered in a thousand beautiful handmade flowers. Misty Or becomes the symbol of post-war femininity of womanhood, this highly romanticized woman, but the woman who has inspired it is forgotten. After Christian's death in 1957, his untimely death of a heart attack, he makes Catherine in his will, he calls her his moral heir, which is a very powerful phrase because Catherine and women like her were the moral compass for France. She protects his legacy. It's thanks to her that the Dior archives that I was able to consult are there because she kept all his drawings, all his illustrations. In every single of his couture collections, he made a piece for Catherine, all of which she kept and all of which are in the archives today. Catherine herself is forgotten, but she goes on growing roses and she lives until the age of 90. And she dies in June, in June 2008. But her roses are still there. Her roses are still grown as the essential ingredient of Miss Dior.
and she carries on growing those roses and those roses that have found a way for her to live life on her own terms as Catherine Dior, she never marries, are also the way for her to find a way to go on living after the terrible trauma of what she had suffered during the Second World War. So for me, she is a great heroine, a heroine of, of, that represents the fight for freedom, for, for a woman to live life on her own terms. And I feel that in telling her story, I've also tried to tell the story of many other women in the resistance, many other women who were in Ravensbrück concentration camp with her, that in a sense, all of their stories that had been forgotten, I have tried to bring a life to life again in, in my book, Mr. Yaw. They are all, in a sense, part of Mr. Yaw, very much so. And their voices that had been silenced, I bring together, I hope, in a chorus in my book. So I hope you'll read it. I know I'm the last speaker and I have my eye on the clock. I'm sure everybody here um, wants to join me in saying thank you so much to 5 by 15 for inviting us. It's been a wonderful lineup of, of speakers. I feel very privileged to have been part of it. And storytelling is part of what makes us human. The sharing of stories is, is what makes us human. So here's to storytelling, to sharing stories, to listening to stories, and here's to 5 by 15. Thank you so much. Thank you, Justine. That was fantastic. What a wonderful story. What a great thing to bring back to the world. I, I had no idea she lived to be, she lived till so recently too. And um, we've all had the Miss Dior. So that is a wonderful, wonderful tale and a lovely way to finish. As you say, stories are what it's all about. So it only remains for me to say a really big thank you to everyone who's spoken tonight, to Safraz Manzor, to Lara Malcolm, to Justine Piketty, John Lanchester, and of course to Oliver Berkman. And as Oliver says, we only have 44,000, whatever, how many, 4,000 weeks left. Um, I don't think I have anything like as many as the rest of you, but on that note, I'm very glad that I've been able to hope to be with you all tonight and it's been quite wonderful and thank you very much indeed and good night. <laughs>